With all these countries gaining their independence, what comes next? In April 1955, Indonesia invited the newly independent Asian and African states to meet and join forces against colonialism. The 29 countries that participated represented a total population of 1.5 billion people, 54% of the world's population. The conference was organized by Indonesia, Burma, or Myanmar, Pakistan, Ceylon, or what we now call Sri Lanka, and India, and was coordinated by Ruslan Abdulghani, the Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. They had a series of goals in mind, to promote goodwill and cooperation among the new nations, to explore and advance their mutual interests, to examine social, economic, and cultural problems, and to focus on the problems of special interests to their peoples, such as racism and colonialism, and to enhance the international visibility of Asia and Africa in world affairs. The Bandung Conference reflected what the organizers regarded as a reluctance by the Western powers to consult with them on decisions affecting Asia in a setting of Cold War tensions, their concern over tension between the People's Republic of China and the United States, their desire to lay firmer foundations for China's peace relations with themselves and the West, their opposition to colonialism, especially French influence in North Africa and its colonial rule in Algeria, and Indonesia's desire to promote its case in the dispute with the Netherlands over Western New Guinea. The conference's stated aims were to promote Afro-Asian economic and cultural cooperation and to oppose colonialism or neo-colonialism by any nation. The conference was an important step towards the eventual creation of the non-aligned movement. Both India and the People's Republic of China sought to claim the leadership of the emerging Asian African nations. Chinese Premier and Foreign Minister Zhou Enlai was the political personality that most impressed the delegates, along with the host of the conference, Indonesian President Sukarno. For the United States, the conference accentuated a central dilemma of its Cold War policy. By currying favor with Third World nations, by proclaiming opposition to colonialism, it risked alienating its colonialist European allies. The United States, at the urging of Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, shunned the conference and was not officially represented. However, the administration issued a series of statements during the lead-up to the conference. These statements suggested that the United States would provide economic aid and attempted to reframe the issue of colonialism as a threat by China and the Eastern Bloc. Representative Adam Clayton Powell of New York attended the conference, sponsored by Ebony and Jet magazines instead of the United States government. He attended basically as a journalist. Powell spoke at some length in favor of American foreign policy there, which assisted the United States standing with the non-aligned nations. When Powell returned to the United States, he urged President Eisenhower and Congress to oppose colonialism and pay attention to the priorities of emerging third world nations. In terms of the Cold War, remember that the U.S. saw the world as divided into good and evil. Capitalism good, communism bad. U.S. good, Soviets evil. The nations represented at Bandung did not see the world in such stark terms. Instead, they forged a third way and began what was later called the non-aligned movement. These nations would not belong to any particular alliances with powerful countries. Instead, they hoped to foster peace and coexistence, secure independence, and non-intervention from the powerful countries like the US, the Soviet Union, or their powerful allies. Let's turn our attention to the continent of Africa. Again, keep in mind some of the themes. Local factors matter, and often, especially in West Africa, we'll see Africans using colonialist structures against the colonizers. And when one nation gets its independence, others tend to follow, although none of this happens without a resistance, and sometimes violence. When Europe colonized Africa, they believed they were doing this to spread civilization and to increase the economic value of their countries. Now, in the grand scheme of things, colonization lasted only a few generations, but still had lasting consequences. From a European standpoint, there were three main developments that led to decolonization. World War I and World War II and the Great Depression first served to undermine Western Europe's confidence in its mission of civilization. People saw the horrors of the battlefields of World War I and World War II, the aerial bombing, and kind of didn't feel as civilized and above everything. Also, World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression also led to Europe's substantial decline in its actual ability to maintain control of its empire. And broadly speaking, many European nations just kind of lost the desire to control those countries. Most African nations gained their independence peacefully, but where there were a significant amount of European settlers, that's where the most violence took place. 
We're going to divide the continent, no pun intended, into three different regions to talk about. And I'm going to give special attention to South Africa at the end of the lecture. South Africa was nominally independent because of the large white population there. But the fight against apartheid is very similar to a lot of the anti-colonial struggles. Now we're going to start with North Africa and just work our way down the continent. Decolonization began north of the Sahara in Northeast Africa. A group known as the WAFT delegation attended the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 to demand Egypt's independence. Included in the group was the political leader Saad Jaglul, who would later become prime minister. When the group was arrested and deported to the island of Malta, a huge uprising occurred in Egypt. From March to April 1919, there were mass demonstrations that became uprisings. This is known in Egypt as the 1919 Revolution. Almost daily demonstrations and unrest continued throughout Egypt for the remainder of the spring. To the surprise of the British authorities, Egyptian women also demonstrated, led by Huda Shah Arawi, who would become the leading feminist voice in Egypt in the first half of the 20th century. The first women's demonstration was held on Sunday, March 16, 1919, and was followed by yet another one on March 20, 1919. Egyptian women would continue to play an important and increasingly public nationalist role throughout the spring and summer of 1919 and beyond. The anti-colonial riots and British suppression of them led to the death of some 800 people. In December 1921, British authorities in Cairo imposed martial law and once again deported Zaglul. Demonstrations again led to violence. In deference to the growing nationalism and at the suggestion of the High Commissioner Lord Allenby, the United Kingdom unilaterally declared Egyptian independence on February 28, 1922, abolishing the protectorate and establishing an independent kingdom of Egypt. However, British influence continued to dominate Egypt's political life and fostered fiscal, administrative, and governmental reforms. Britain retained control of the Suez Canal Zone, Sudan and Egypt's external protection, protection of foreigners and separate courts for foreigners, the police forces, the army, the railways, and the communications. British troops were also stationed in cities and towns. Now, I think it's really important to talk about the Suez Canal here. I, ne I didn't bring up the Suez Canal earlier, which I probably should have, but Britain basically built the Suez Canal, which at the time was the biggest canal before the Panama Canal. The Suez Canal was the canal in the world. And this was basically to make trading with India a lot easier. Remember, in 1922, India was still a British colony. So the Suez Canal was vitally important to Britain, which is why they wanted to retain control over it. After years of negotiations, in 1936, King Farouk of Egypt signed the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of Alliance, which ended British military occupation of Egypt except around the Suez Canal. So the British were still going to protect their sea route to India, their shortcut to India. And the Suez Canal was, of course, very important in World War II. One of the biggest and most immediate consequences of the war in Africa was that Britain felt the need to defend Egypt and the Suez Canal at all costs against the Italian-German Axis powers. Nationalist, anti-British feelings continued to grow after the war. In 1952, a military coup led by Gamal Abdel Nasser overthrew King Farouk of Egypt and established the modern Republic of Egypt. And this had tremendous consequences on the history of the Middle East. But that's another story for another day. And I know, we're running out of days. We're going to put a pin on North Africa, and in the next section of the lecture, we're going to move into East Africa, talking about Ethiopia, a country that had not been colonized in the 19th century, but still had a struggle against a European nation. Stay tuned.